Uh, I will first introduce who will be on stage today, Jenny O'Dell and Austin Jenkins, and then uh, we'll say a few words about the content of the conversation tonight. Um, Jenny O'Dell is a multidisciplinary artist and writer based in Auckland, California. Her work examines the ways in which attention or lack thereof leads to consequential shifts in perception at the level of every day. A note is uh, Jenny's book, How to Do Nothing, Resisting the Attention Economy, which will inspire the conversation today, was also what our graduate program picked as a common book this year, a book that introduces our community to a pressing issue of global relevance that we encourage our students, alumni, faculty, and staff to read, and to inspire collective reflection amongst our community. Many of our students, alumni, and faculty are here today in the audience. Hi to you all. Facilitating the conversation today uh, will be Austin Jenkins. Austin is the Olympia-based political reporter for the Northwest News Network. In that position, Austin covers Northwest politics and public policy, as well as the Washington State Legislature. You can also see Austin on television as the Washington State, uh, as a host of TVW's Emmy-nominated public affairs program, Inside Olympia. Uh, to brag a little bit, Austin also is a recent alumni of our graduate program. Um, so about tonight's event, over the next 90 minutes or so, uh, we are creating a space where we can come together collectively to talk about and think about how we live in an uh, age of constant distraction. Jenny's book will be our vessel for a thoughtful dif discussion and reflection. The attention economy that the book talks extensively about is an ever-evolving, multi-institutional network of competing forces. These actors have one goal in mind, to shape how we observe our world. Tonight is our chance to collectively ponder how we can respond to or resist such forces. So with that in mind, let me introduce you all and welcome to stage Jenny O'Dell and Austin Jenkins. Good evening, thank you for being here on a Friday night. Hello, Jenny, and welcome to Seattle. Thank you. It's great to be here. Uh, to sort of set the stage a little bit more, to talk a little bit about the conversation we want to start here and we hope will continue as you leave and long after you've departed here tonight, I want to talk a, a little bit about our goals. Um, one of our goals is to uh, think about how we can maybe disengage and then re-engage with this attention economy and do so in a much more purposeful way. Um, we also want to explore what are the obligations of the companies and the entities and the people who are creating this attention economy? What ethical obligations do they have? How should they be thinking as creators about um, what they are creating and the impact it has on us? So that's something that we want to think about and talk about tonight as well. Um, we also, I think, have an opportunity here to um, think about how we can, and this is a big part of the book, disconnect from our devices and our screens and reconnect with the physical world and how to do that in a really intentional way. This is how I see our conversation sort of unfolding tonight. We're going to get to know Jenny a little bit better. Uh, we're going to um, identify the problem that she identified and talk a little bit about a framework for solutions and then we're going to have an action plan. And while we're doing that, we're also going to try to bring in some really topical and sort of bigger 30,000 foot issues. So with that, again, Jenny, it's great to be here with you. Um, you were a digital artist. Well, first off, you grew up in Silicon Valley. You now live in Oakland. You're a digital artist. You are a writer. Uh, you teach at Stanford. So if you bring all of that together, how did you land on writing a book about the attention economy? And that just notion that that's what needed to be addressed? Uh, I think it was probably kind of a long time coming for me. Um, I think 2016 was definitely a, a flashpoint, but um, when I kind of look back at my upbringing, I mean, I grew up, yeah, in, I grew up in Cupertino. <laughs> um, and I, so I was kind of surrounded by uh, not like, 
startups at that time, but just surrounded by technology companies. Both of my parents worked for, you know, large tech companies. Um, and so I think that was just in the background for me. And then um, I was an English major for undergrad. Um, and then I went on to get my MFA. And after I got my MFA, I found myself very annoyed with the way um, the intersection of art and technology was uncritically talked about or exhibited in San Francisco, which is where I was living. Um, and so that also feels like kind of a small piece for me where I was interested in doing something more critical or maybe more subtle or ambiguous. Um, I also, at this point, have five years of experience teaching art to non-art majors at Stanford. So that's another mark for kind of trying to argue the importance of um, uh, and the value of something like art, especially conceptual art or um, art that's not so obvious or doesn't have an obvious uh, sort of value to a type of mindset that might want to kind of optimize or find the best way to do something. So that's all just kind of, you know, and, and my, my own work as a digital artist was often, you know, using digital media, but in service of the viewer then going outside and seeing things differently at the end of the day. So the, it's really landing outside in real life. Um, and then, yeah, late 2016, obviously, there was the election. Um, there was also the ghost ship fire in Oakland, where I live now, um, in which a lot of artists um, and community-minded people died. So um, that was just kind of like the, like I said, the flashpoint and also um, kind of like a moment of silence for me. And in, I was just observing the, the kind of like crisis version of a lot of those problems that I had been thinking about, I think, in a more vague way. Um, and uh, yeah, so it really just came from a question uh, about, uh, or a, an observation of myself and that I had kind of stopped. I had been going to a rose garden near my apartment and sitting there and doing nothing. And so I was just really trying to investigate why that felt necessary and why it felt like a survival tactic. Um, and that is kind of how I arrived in a very unexpected way at this uh, this question. But like I said, I think I think a lot of times you think there was a moment where you had an idea, but really it was you know five years in the making or more. Do you feel like you were radicalized by writing this book, or were you radicalized before you wrote the book, and that's what led to it? Uh, probably something in between. I, I think that definitely uh, I was very humbled in doing research for the book. Um, I had this kind of idyllic four-month period last summer. Um, I, I wrote the book in those four months because I teach full-time, and that was the only time I had to do it. And I was spending a lot of time in the library, and specifically all the subjects that I needed um, in the Stanford library were in the basement. And it felt very removed from sort of like, you know, social media, but also just like kind of like everything. Like I felt like I was in this vault, um, and I was going kind of like back in time, and I was just humbled at finding you know, there's a lot of low-hanging fruit <laughs> in terms of, like, uh, things that were written or that happened even just, like, 10 years ago. And I think that, you know, we're all kind of caught up in this constant amnesia right now and this constant, like, endless state of urgency. Um, and, and so if, if I was radicalized, it was actually just by, re like, realizing the, con like the huge amount of context around every single thing that I take for granted and every, th and every part of the present that I live in um, all of the struggles, you know, that led to that. This is something that just, you know, seems like part of the everyday now. Um, and it's sort of like, it, it just kind of sh shook everything loose for me where I saw that there was no, at every point in history, it, nothing was given. Um, and it obviously gives you a very different perspective on the present and the future. You have talked a lot about sort of in-betweenness and how in many ways, we all have to learn to reside in between the digital world and the physical world, the attention economy, and, and holding on to our own attention and control of that. You, you obviously work in digital art, um, vi digital visual art. Um, you are also um, biracial. And so I'm just interested in having you speak a little bit about what in-betweenness means to you, how you define it, and what that experience is like for you personally. Sure. So that that term in between us is actually something that I that I came upon in writing the book proposal. Is something I kind of realized in writing that proposal um, why why my perspective felt sort of like mine. Um, and I think yeah, it has to do with this kind of recurring theme in my life of being, you know, like growing up in Cupertino and being you know in the midst of Silicon Valley, but but also spending lots of time in the mountains. 
which are right next to Silicon Valley. Um, you know, and then being like having a background in writing or you know studying writing in undergrad, but then doing art, uh, making digital art that's about the physical world, um, and then and then also just yeah being uh, like literally the product of two very different cultures. Um, and I think that uh, a lot of the most meaningful but also challenging experiences that I've had have ex have had this quality of discomfort where um, it would be so much easier if you were just one thing. Um, and uh, or it'd be so much easier if you made work that was easy to explain, that was just in one discipline. Uh, even right now, right, like it'd be easier if I had written a book, you know, for my job. It'd be easier if I wrote a book about art, <laughs> just an art book. Um, but instead I keep doing these things that are kind of like in between or they're two, you know, two or more things. And um, I think for a long time I found that frustrating because that's just a frustrating position to be in if you're in a situation that s selects for you know, really optimized versions of one thing. But as I was writing the book, I actually started to see it as a survival strategy. So, I mean, I talk in the very beginning about uh, the, the story of the useless tree, the Taoist story, where there's a, a tree that uh, Carpenter makes fun of because it's, it's useless as lumber. It's sort of a big, gnarled tree. Um, and then the tree comes to him in a dream and basically makes fun of him and says, um, uselessness has been very useful for me. I'm still alive. <laughs> Um, and then, as I mentioned in the book, also Oakland has our own, you know, version of the useless tree. It's a, the last remaining old growth redwood tree in the East Bay Hills that was discovered in the 60s. It was thought that they were all gone. And it too was uh, spared because it was a weird shape and it was not actually big compared to normal old growth redwood trees. Now, of course, it's huge compared to everything else, but that kind of like odd shapedness or this um, resistance to going straight into the sawmill <laughs> Um, is something that, of course, is going to be uncomfortable, but it's also, I think, a way to survive. So let's talk a little bit about the problem that you've identified. And certainly the first place we go is social media and the devices that we all have in our pockets these days. You write that these devices and social media sites are stealing our attention. Um, that they are addictive, that they serve as sort of this constant alarm bell, that they are designed to keep us in a state of constant anxiety and envy and distraction. And yet, we tweeted, uh, it wasn't quite a selfie, we had somebody take our picture upstairs. Um, we all have to live with this. We are all existing in 2019 when where you communicate and connect with people very often is on social media. It's how you find out what's happening in the world. So I'm interested in your own relationship to social media and, and how you're thinking about it these days. Are you thinking about it as the enemy? Are you thinking about it in an anti-capitalist sort of frame of mind? How are you relating to social media in 2019? I sort of hopefully, you know, I, I feel that there, this is like an, another in, you know, in-between moment. Uh, I, I feel like I'm holding out for something else. Like, you know, in the book, I really am interested in uh, some kind of non-commercial, decentralized social network. I don't think there's anything wrong with social networks. Like we've had social networks as long as there have been humans, right? Like they're very important, especially, you know, I've been thinking about this a lot with the fires in California, um, like getting information, you know, like about something just very useful. Um, like we, we've always needed to share information. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, there's obviously something wrong with, uh, monetizing that and uh, creating a situation where anxiety is actually really great for the machine um, financially. So I, I, you know, I still, you know, I engage with social media um, in this way right now where, like I said, I'm sort of, I'm waiting for something else. I also just have a giant grain of salt. It's like every time I go into that space, I just take a moment to just remember what it is before I walk in the door. Um, which I think is like that just even that small pause and that removal is is huge because it's when things get habitual that you you lose that critical space. The term attention economy, I don't know that we've necessarily properly defined it yet. I know that you say that in essence what's happening is for-profit companies and their products are dictating our attention and our social interactions. I, I think of it a little bit as even if you never wanted to go to a casino, the casino has now arrived in your palm or at your desktop. It is here. 
and all of those bells and whistles to keep somebody glued to the slot machine. It's now a part of our daily lives. It's in our bedrooms. It's everywhere. But just again, in terms of framing this conversation, how do you define the attention economy? What do you want us to be thinking about when we hear that term? I think that, I mean, my definition is not that different from, uh, you know, I obviously didn't coin the phrase attention economy the way it's been used, which I think is just, you know, uh, even things like advertising, I think would be an example of the attention economy, just any sort of model where the, the goal for a company is to just get more attention, whether that's more engagement, more time spent on a site, uh, just uh, more eyeballs, right? Um, and uh, and often I think that that's in a kind of crass like metrics form. So uh, something I've been really interested in even more since having written the book is that um, if if there's attention and there's an attention economy that assumes that attention is currency and currency like a u usually currency is standardized. Um, so it's always the same units of the same thing. And and when and I'm sort of trying to advocate in the book for cultivating different forms of attention, different speeds of attention, different depths of attention, um, and not kind of stay in the same kind all the time. And, uh, and I think that that's actually, you know, obviously, you know, help, helps, on an, helps you on an individual level, but it actually creates a really big problem for something like the attention economy, which can't measure things like that. So I give this d admittedly depressing example in one of the chapters where if I'm forced to watch an ad, which I often am, um, it can't be measured how I'm watching that ad. I often watch ads from the point of view of um, trying to imagine them as being part of a sci-fi future, dystopian future, like the ads that they would put like in a dystopian sci-fi film set in the future, and I just look at ads like that. Um, and they don't know that, so yeah. <laughs> so sticking with this idea of currency, you, you write in the book that I am less interested in a mass exodus from Facebook and Twitter than I am in a mass movement of attention. What happens when people regain control over their attention and begin to direct it again together? So I want to break that apart a little bit. I'm really interested in this idea of a mass move, movement of attention, but I'm also interested in what it means to do it together. So when you, when you write that, what are you proposing? What are you, I mean, it's, it sounds kind of revolutionary. It sounds like if you grew up in Silicon Valley, you might be a heretic. What are you proposing here? <laughs> I mean, that just comes from a sort of simple observation that I've had, you know, uh, just about attention in general. Like if you, I'm sure everyone can think of an example like this. Um, if there's something that you, something unusual that you, or slightly unusual that you pay a lot of attention to, your friends are eventually probably gonna start paying attention to it too. Um, I don't know where Joe is, but my boyfriend can attest to this, that like I pay more attention to like 80s and 90s car models now because of him, <laughs> but he also pays more attention to birds. Um, and so there's, you know, uh, there's kind of like contagious quality of, of attention. Um, and uh, and I, I, I think it's already just on an individual level when you kind of repattern your attention, it's so just individually revolutionary. Like you will see things literally that you didn't see before. Um, the world looks totally different. Now you add two people, right? Like I, I give an example in the book of going to a creek in Cupertino that goes through the Apple campus uh, with a childhood friend where we both realized that this unnamed creek in our memory was the same creek. Um, and we went and we walked in the creek bed when it was dry and we're kind of affirming its existence to each other. Like, this is really here. This is a very strange perspective on this really supposedly boring suburb that we grew up in that we thought we knew. And it's just the more people you add to that, the more I think you're sort of rendering a reality and a common ground where um, things look very different and you can talk to other people about how, how and why they're different. So the, this idea of... of sort of taking our attention, thinking of it, they think of it as a commodity. We own it, we have the power to determine where we place it, when we place it, how we place it, and that we should do so kind of more intentionally and, and with it in mind, that, that we in essence have to be the counter lever to what the people who are creating these spaces and places are trying to to do without us even realizing, right? I mean, that's so much of it, it seems like, is just this basic awareness. And, and that leads me to wonder, 
we've talked about the digital age, and we've talked about what we all know today in terms of what's in front of us, but I keep thinking now, you know, we're sunsetting the digital age, we're on the cusp of the machine learning age. What's coming next? I mean, the reality is that the, this age of acceleration, as Thomas Friedman calls it, got way ahead of the regulators, and it's lapping the regulators. And now we've got conversations about, you know, has Google gotten too big? Does it need to be broken up? Is Amazon too big? Does it need to be, to be broken up? But it also seems like as we think about where we've been, that the question now needs to be, how are we going to prepare for what's coming, especially from an attention standpoint? I'm just wondering if you started to think about that yourself, especially as machine learning and virtual reality and augmented reality comes online. Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I don't really know how directly I can speak to, like, you know, actual concrete, like, changes that are happening in the technology, I mean, given my background, but I do think that uh, just paying attention, like, just any kind of critical distance from anything is always good. Just doesn't matter. Like, that'll always, that'll continue being a good thing, um, continuing to have people scrutinize these technologies um, and giving people the time and resources to do that is just more and more important. Um, I mean, it's kind of interesting to watch, like, uh, as someone who uses a lot of Photoshop and I teach Photoshop, just watching, like, the sort of general public's ability to, to spot Photoshop photos tracking with the development of Photoshop. <laughs> so one would hope that there's kind of equivalence with, with other changes, but um, I, don't, I don't know. I don't really know that, like, there's anything more specific I can say than just, you know, paying extremely careful attention to everything that's happening. Well, part of the next piece of the problem that you identify is that our attention is being captured, it's being monetized, and that what's happening is that at the same time we are disconnecting from the natural world, the physical world. And um, you, I think you talk about the idea that you know augmented reality is just look up from your, your screen and take in the world around you. But what is the the danger and the harm and the concern that you see around this, what we're giving up in exchange for um, caving to or falling prey to the attention economy? Yeah, I mean, one, one thing I'll just say, like I, I don't wanna sort of like lump myself into the like, the sort of like, people, everyone's looking at their phones too much, like okay, mm -hmm. like yeah. that's sort of like, I'm not, yeah. I'm not even really interested in like, uh, the, the, I mean, it's just very easy. It's like a very easy judgment for people to make, right? And I, and I, uh, I think it's a little bit more complicated. You know, I give uh, the example of iNaturalist, which is an app that you can use to identify plants. You can take a picture and it identifies plants. Um, and then a person will confirm or deny. And so if you see me going on a hike, looking at my phone, that's probably what I'm doing. But, uh, but that's an example of, you know, like I, that is a digitally mediated experience that's actually giving me more, uh, more access to my surroundings. But in terms of, I think, the moments when you, you know, when you are giving something up by being sort of like overly absorbed uh, or caught in this kind of short loop of anxiety and despair and, you know, Twitter shouting match or whatever, um, is just like, I don't want to sound you know, like life is passing you by, but, but it is, right? Um, and I think there's this kind of weird paradox where, um, if, you're if you're caught in that constant loop of urgency and anxiety where it feels like time is of the essence, also there's this weird dulling that happens where every day feels the same. Like it's like another day in dystopia or something. And, and I think it's like really helpful to not, I mean I talk a lot about place in the book, but also time to remember that like today is not yesterday, tomorrow is not today. Um, there are things happening, you know, potentially right in front of your face. I mean this still happens to me all the time where I'm, like going down some like despair wormhole on my phone and I look up and this just happened, actually, this just happened to me yesterday. I was on campus and I was interrupted by an oak titmouse, which is a very small, adorable gray bird. And it seems, it's not, well, no birds are boring, but it seems like a pretty like <laughs> standard bird. It's like everywhere in the oak trees. And I thought I knew this bird like two years ago and then every year, it's, or like every month, I hear some new sound and I realize it's the oak titmouse. It's making all these different sounds. And then yesterday I saw and it was eating leaf galls, which are like parasitic like wasp things on leaves. And it was like pecking them off and like putting them on its foot and just like eating it. And it's just like weird behavior I had never seen. 
Um, and that, like, I think that that just keeps happening to me, where I, like, I'm in this like, cycle where everything is the same, and then like, I get interrupted by something that is different every day that, that I haven't noticed. Um, and so I think, and that's involuntary, but I, I think you can welcome those moments. You, you're, you're making us feel okay about looking at our phones. I'm, I'm going to paraphrase from your book where you say, digital distraction is taking us away from the one life we have to live. And that, that was a pretty profound line in the book because we do have one life to live and we don't know how long it's going to be. And whether it is staring at our phones or just being distracted from that which is so present, whether it's the person across from you or the bird that is near you, that there is sort of an eroding and degrading thing that can happen if you're not, again, aware of that. And nobody's saying, and, and we'll talk about this, but you're not saying run for the hills, you're not saying go cold turkey, but to think about living a life in balance. And that the, it seems like the repercussions, as you view them, are, though, pretty serious if we don't get hip to what's going on here. Yeah, no, that's, that's true. It definitely, I guess I just... I, the reason I made that clarification is just because I think it's really easy to um, kind of be, to like oversimplify the, the boundary between like, uh, like you know, like all, all things on your phone are bad, all things off your phone are good, like, you know what I mean? It goes so back think, to in-betweenness. Yeah, yeah. But, I, but, I, but I agree that like generally, like generally my argument is that uh, there's, I mean, I, I, I often just feel this kind of sense of frustration with um, the, the, the fact that the thing that's in front of you is often just so amazing. And I mean, I, I give all these examples of art at the beginning of the book. My favorite pieces of art are ones that create framing devices for something that's already there. So, uh, you know, like the James Terrell rooms with the, you know, square hole in the ceiling where it just allows you to see the clouds passing by more distinctly. Or, uh, you know, a piece where you, you are ushered into an cordoned off area and you watch the sunset and you applaud. Um, you know, like these, these kind of, like a very light touch where it's just like, hey, there's this thing that was already in front of you, but I'm gonna make it easier for you to see it. And then I'm gonna give you the time and the space to see it. And then you've kind of slowly realized that it's actually very amazing. And as an artist, like I've always worked that way because I think that, that thing is way more interesting than anything that I could ever make. So that's sort of like my, my, like when I, when I worry about, you know, like missing out, like that's what I'm worried about missing out on is like the thing that's already there, the people that are already there, the history that's already there, like I'm, that I would be missing out on that because I'm like chasing this weird carrot all the time. But what a lot of people are fearing missing out on is a social interaction or something happening. And I'm interested in what you're observing uh, teaching at Stanford. Um, with university level students. Certainly um, in my own experience, uh, we're seeing kids, especially in adolescence, uh, anxiety levels, depression levels through the roof. Um, it is alarming. I talk to pediatricians who say that they're seeing kids who physically react if they are separated from their phones. There are kids who will have panic attacks now if they're not separated. I, I don't want to focus on the device, but as we think about what's at stake again, and in sort of what you're seeing, and I know in your art classes and in your classes, you're trying to get today's young people to just slow down and how difficult that is because they don't know anything other than being hyperproductive and going, going, going. Yeah, I, I wrote an op-ed uh, for the New York Times for their back to school kind of uh, section um, about time. Uh, in teaching, so, and my argument was very simple, which was just that students need more time. But it was, but it had two parts, which was that students need more time, but that that time also needs to not, not always be figured as money. Um, so it needs to not always be presented as like a resource that you squeeze results out of. Um, and something that I have come to feel really strongly, um, at least, you know, about the students that I've had, is that it's actually, it, if they're on their phones a lot, that is a symptom of something bigger, and and the something bigger is that they have gone through extremely rigor a, a, a rigorous kind of education where time is money, um, where everything you do has to have a reason, everything you do has to have a payoff. You're evaluated, you're tested all the time on everything. Um, I don't imagine. I, I imagine there's less sort of open, unstructured space um, for them than there was for me. And, and I think that's what leads to this 
this kind of uh, fixation. It's not, it's not just on the sort of level of the phone and the social media. I think it's, it's an entire mindset that can't see time as anything other than money. Well, and let's talk about that because the reality is that most people in this room feel that pressure. We feel it at work. We feel that the hours of the day are limited. Our bosses expect a lot of us. Uh, if we work for a for-profit company, it's got to make money. There are metrics and measurables at every step of the way. And so by definition, the economy is demanding productivity. And it also seems like you were wanting us to maybe redefine what that looks like. So let's be realistic. It may sound good to, uh, to, to say no to that, but the stakes seem really high. And the constant message we're getting every day. I mean, I know it myself. I feel bad if I step out of my office and go have coffee with somebody because I'm not sure that's the best use of my time during the working hours, even though I know intrinsically that that sort of connection with the source is valuable. Yeah, I, I think it's, I mean, it's kind of complicated because, you know, the stakes are not the same for everyone. So um, I use the word margin a lot in the chapter where I talk about the history of, of refusal, uh, or it's called anatomy of a refusal. Um, so I am an example of someone who does have a margin, right? Like I, um, I mean, I am a contract worker technically, um, and I, uh, I feel very subject to the time is money equation, but not 100%. I, I do have, you know, the, a little bit of space. Um, some people have more space than that. A lot of people have less space than that. Um, and so I, I think it's really important for anyone who does have that margin to, to use it um, and to use it in a way that would open up more of a margin for other people. Um, so I think that that's one kind of important part is like, I think there's a difference between me feeling like taking a day off feels expensive versus like a person who can't take a day off, like actually can't take a day off because of their job. So, um, and, and that knowing that like makes it a little bit easier for me to maybe like f feel, feel the resistance of taking that time, but if I, especially if I'm gonna be using that time to think about how to make more time, um, that kind of is helpful for me. Well, let's start to frame the, the solution and I think we'll It'll lead nicely to kind of continue this thought that can we do that? Is it possible? How could we do it? How can we do it given some people have more luxury to do it, more privilege to do it, others less so? Um, but the framework that you present is this idea of needing to stretch forward, strengthening our attention and perception muscles, um, reminding ourselves that attention may in fact be, and to quote you here, the last resource we have to withdraw in this pedal to the metal time. So as you're thinking about a realistic way of framing a solution to this attention economy situation we find ourselves in, how are you thinking about kind of this rewiring or reawareness that we're going to take with us uh, going forward? Yeah, I mean, I... Uh this is this is not maybe like very amenable to the idea of like a solution, but at the end I kind of talk about this big knot of interrelated issues that uh, that I think if you know if you can pull on any of those threads, you're you're doing something. So um, for me, like a big a big piece of what I'm suggesting has to do with attention to place. So I talk a lot about bioregionalism, uh, becoming familiar with the place where you are, also becoming familiar with the history. Um, and uh, just like learning what it means to be more in a place, especially with others who are there and have been there. Um, but I also recognize that that, again, is different, you know, that's differently accessible to different people. So uh, it's one, you know, I can recommend, you know, going, going bird watching with a group of uh, bird people or, you know, spending more time outdoors, but that depends on where you live. And so it, that very quickly becomes entangled in issues of like, well, you know, in Oakland, where are all the parks? Uh, why, why are there not that many parks in West Oakland? Like, it's easy for you to do the things I'm talking about in the book if you live in the hills. Um, and so you, like, you know, and then even digitally, there's kind of a version of that where I mentioned the, the potential for, um, like, digital... Uh, or gated attentions of a con uh, gated, gated um, sorry gated yes. communities of attention yes. um, where you have you know someone who maybe has you know three three kids and two jobs and like just needs to put the iPad in front of their kid just to kind of like get through the day versus like Steve Jobs not letting his kids use 
um, technology at the dinner table. Um, so there's there's just I I think it's there's a kind of uneven topography of uh, what is actually possible and what maybe what part of this big knot is easiest to um, or affordable for someone to actually work on. And sometimes that's just going to be, you know mentally trying to create some space between you and this, the attention economy, even just in the, that moment, just like trying to take a step back, not going and staying in a cabin somewhere in the mountains, but just in that moment, um, look like watching yourself watching something or watching yourself engaging and just, just making that simple disconnect in your mind. Sometimes that's all you can get away with, but I think that, that even that's really important. And if, obviously if a lot of people did that and, and talked about it, like, you know, maybe that would lead to something even more. The title of your book is How to Do Nothing. You write that nothing is harder than doing nothing. Um, why, why is it so hard and why is it so important to practice doing nothing? I mean, it kind of goes back to what I was saying about the, the, the things that are in front of you. I, I think it's just, um, I feel like we spend a lot of time going back and forth between um, an analytical state of mind and a more empty ob observational state of mind. This is something that Pauline Oliveros, uh, the uh, composer that I talk about in the book, um, has also talked about that that our culture privileges the analytical state of mind. Obviously, uh, you know, knee-jerk reactions, knowing knowing what something is the minute you look at it. A, you know, a clickbait headline is like an extreme version of this, but but we're doing some version of it all the time. And so I think that this, you know, by doing nothing, I really just mean like a non-goal-oriented state of mind, uh, the open state of mind where you're just watching, you haven't judged yet. Um, you're just seeing what's there. Um, and I think if you are actually doing that, you will usually be surprised. Um, and so that's, you know, just on a personal level, I think that that's um, really important. And I also think on the other side of things, like if you were to actually sit with the feeling, if, if doing nothing is actually really hard, and you sit with that feeling of why it's hard, and you just keep going with that, and you just keep asking yourself why, kind of like how a kid will just keep asking why, I feel like a lot, like, it, it leads to these questions that are very uncomfortable about, like, what is your life for? Or, like, what is, you know, what is the, because I, I think that a lot of things like personal branding and, and related, um, ways of thinking propose your life as a product that you're supposed to optimize and get something out of at the end of the day. And it's actually not that hard to undermine that because it makes no sense. Um, but it also means, <laughs> it also means that you have to then continue on with that questioning and you have to sort of consider your mortality and, you know, like it gets into these like, you know, big uncomfortable questions. And I think like that's actually what makes doing nothing hard for a lot of people. Well, let me pause on that question of personal branding, because that is also something, just as we're expected to be productive, we're expected to develop our personal brands, especially in the communications field. Um, there are many people in this audience tonight who are current and future communication leaders, and establishing that brand is important, and it's something that's expected, we're expected to really reside in, on social media, we're expected to capture all of these moments. So, is there a way to do it to have, have it both ways? Is there, what advice would you give to somebody who's saying, yeah, you know, this is the expectation. This is how I'm going to succeed professionally. For that matter, you have a brand that you're developing. <laughs> um, you gotta, you want to sell books though, right? You want to sell maybe art? I mean, what, what, help us understand though, like how to maybe, how to think about this differently. Because we've been told for a really long time, have a brand. Um, I so I mean I you're think shuddering at the idea that I said yeah, you had a brand. <laughs> I um, I mean I think yeah like that's, there are obviously situations where you you need to do that as part of your job. I think the thing and I think that's been true for a long time. Um, I think maybe what's different now is like you see that seeping into the, like other areas of life where it shouldn't be, or it's like hap in, or like even temporally it's like it's colonizing more of your mind. So it's like you have situations where even as you're experiencing something, you're already thinking about how you're gonna articulate and package it on Instagram. And like you're already thinking about numbers, like even just as you're having the experience. And of course this is not true for everyone, but I think it's true for a lot of, you know, especially young people. Um, and, and like that to me seems unnecessary and like something that, that you don't have to do, that you actually have a decision 
Um, and the thing that I get worried about is um, be because um, a lot of the ways that social media is designed are very habit forming and they, you know, they study that, that they're supposed to be like that. Um, that there are things that sometimes you might be doing that not only do you not have to do, but you actually were never given a moment to ask whether you wanted to do it in the first place. Um, and then time goes on and you get very used to doing that. And there was never that kind of like, wait, but like, why, why am I doing this? Um, and so I guess like, I, I think that you can't like, like the way to have it both ways is to just, to, to tr try to always remember to be more than one thing is maybe like one way of putting it. So um, for me, it's like really important that there's um, a large part of my experience and my personality that not only will I, do I refuse to share, I actually can't share because it can't be put into words. Um, it can't be articulated, it can't be made into something that can be evaluated, it's not, can't be verbalized. Um, and by the sort of standards of social media and visibility online, like that means it doesn't exist. Um, but I know it exists and I know that it's like the most important thing. So as long as I know that, then when I, when I do go to social media, it's like, well, okay, here's, your, here's the thing that I put on social media, there it is. It's, it's over there. Um, meanwhile, I'm like having my actual experience in my life and I, and I am aware that that has a kind of gravity to it and an importance. Um, so I think you can, you know, as, lo it's, as long as you can avoid falling into the trap of having, wanting to have all of your experience be somehow evaluated or optimized or legible, then I think you're fine. <laughs> The, uh, we've talked about more intentionality and kind of awareness. I want to take this a step further because you also talk about actual resistance. And we often think of the term resistance in the political sense, um, but you're talking about refusal in place around the attention economy. What, what in your mind is an act of meaningful, a meaningful act of refusal in this day and age? What does that look like in this context? What does it mean to stand apart? What does it mean to, to resist and refuse? Those are strong words. Yeah, I, um, again, like I said, I think that looks different for different people based on what is available to you at any given moment. Um, I think the, the sort of kernel of most, um, of most meaningful refusals is just um, awareness of the thing that you were just maybe participating in without questioning. So uh, this is sort of an odd metaphor, but I have had lucid dreams for almost all of my life. Um, and I have crazy dreams every night and some of them are lucid. Um, and if you've ever had a lucid dream, you know that there's a very strange moment where you were just, you know, doing something. I have a lot of stressful dreams, so, you know, like I'm, I'm late to my class and all these things are happening. And then I, I sort of have this weird moment of suspicion. Um, and then I'm like, oh, oh, this is a dream. Nothing around me changes. So all the circumstances are the same, but my attitude towards the surroundings are completely different where now it, seem, it seems like I can move my arms and legs. Um, I can decide where to go. I'm suddenly very curious about all of these things that I was just running away from. Um, and I feel like I have time. Um, I, I'm no longer subject to the time of the dream. I have my own time where I can, you know, at least until I actually wake up, I can, you know, walk around and look at things. And really all that is is just an infusion of agency. Like I feel like I have agency and I am acting from within. Um, and so I just even having that moment, I think, um, is already kind of the beginning of some kind of refusal because um, you need to actually be able to see the, the structure that you're in or that you're trying to refuse. You have to be able to actually know it very closely, um, like sort of know your enemy and study it with even with a kind of a morbid curiosity. Um, that, that I think that that's kind of like the, the laying the groundwork for then, you know, whatever else you're able to do alone or with other people. I think the with other people part is really important and I, I mentioned the, the general strike in San Francisco uh, 1934 as a moment in which, you know, that's just kind of a, a very good example of what was possible when a lot of individual people who were subject to incredibly inhumane work conditions and speed up, having to work faster and faster and also being subject to these very unpredictable work schedules, um, when they were actually able to, you know, come together um, and unionize in new ways and actually change those conditions. So. Um, so I think that that's, you know, that's what's down the road. But I think that, that the sort of, yeah, the kernel of that is just the stopping and becoming 
just kind of looking around and getting familiar with the structure that maybe felt invisible before. Okay. And maybe, you know, I'm sort of infusing into those words my own kind of bias or definition of what that means. And I think of a hard refusal and maybe what you're describing and envisioning is something that's a little less, I don't know, doctrinaire or a little less intense um, and maybe a little more nuanced. You, you do write that, that, quote, I think that doing nothing in the sense of refusing productivity and stopping to listen entails an active process of listening that seeks out the effects of racial, environmental, and economic injustice and brings about real change. And I'd like to ask you, how so? Why is it so important to stop, to engage in active listening? We probably hear a lot of things, but we don't necessarily listen and absorb that. And how doing those things could affect it injustices. I just, I mean, I, I think some of it is just kind of like a breaking out of a, a loop. So uh, I think something I described at the beginning of the book is like, uh, if you compare uh, like a permaculture farm or just like a, a healthy ecosystem to a Monsanto farm, like we're kind of in the Monsanto farm th thing right now where uh, everyone, you know, have, you have a highly individualized culture that's highly competitive and it's kind of like uh, more and more every man for himself. Um, uh, you know, like I'm, I'm gonna work on the project of my optimizing my own life. <laughs> uh, and I don't have time for anything else. Um, and, uh, and so that's obviously does not bode well for things like organizing or just attention to others, um, being able to listen to others. I mean, I think some of it's just like, it's strategic, right? Like if you're trying to, if you're trying to uh, make use of all of like the knowledge and experience of the people around you, like you need to be able to listen and you need to be able to pause and make space. Um, and that that's just like in, in the scheme of trying to yeah, move things forward, that's just like a pretty basic strategy. So, yeah. Do you, to take that a step further though, the injustice kind of underlying a lot of injustice are systems and systems that need to be ch changed, systems that need to be torn down and rebuilt to be more equitable. That takes work. It takes the work of individuals and then the collective. It takes a willingness to see through, um, you know, arduous journeys and battles. And again, in the context of the attention economy, if we're thinking about feeling powerless to this technology and to those who are trying to monetize and commoditize our attention. And yet we've got these intractable issues that we have not resolved. How do we get from there, where they're owning our attention, to here, where we've not only reclaimed it, but we've reconnected, and we're starting to solve fundamental problems, fundamental inequities? I think there's actually a weird like chicken and the egg thing here where um, I think that so much of what runs the attention economy is despair um, and a feeling of um, being ineffective, right? Like that has to be the defining feeling of our time is that like there's something, there are many incredibly urgent things in front of you and you, and you're extremely aware of all of them and you can't, and you're not, you can't do anything and you can't even imagine what it is that you would do. Um, and that's why I find things like, um, you know, organizing, especially like on a local level or and not even or just organizing, but, um, you know, going to the, like the local meeting of like the, uh, like the California Native Plant Society. Like I, I remember like going to a meeting of theirs when I was just feeling like a lot of despair and just being physically in a room with other people who were paying attention to the same thing. Um, it felt so just it felt so different um, than you know like scrolling through something kind of idly um, and so I think that like finding traction um, by being in those kinds of spaces actually is a really interesting antidote to the attention economy because I think like part of what's driving that is the lack of, of traction so then if you can find traction that's obviously helpful but in order to find those people in those spaces you have to be able to walk away from uh, the more seductive parts of the attention economy. So it's, they're kind of interrelated. Okay. This, this other piece that is so important to what you've written about and to what you're proposing for us in terms of, 
of a solution, if you will, and a, and a plan of action is this reconnecting with the physical world, which you've talked a lot about. But you write that realities are, after all, inhabitable. If we can render a new reality together with attention, perhaps we can meet each other there. And so reconnecting to the land, being curious about the place you live, connecting with people in that place, understanding the history of that place, and then working on shared values. Um, I just want to give you an opportunity to speak to the importance that you feel of bioregionalism, understanding sense of place, reclaiming sense of place. Yeah, I mean, I can give an example from like a couple weeks ago, I was walking, uh, I was about two blocks from my apartment and I, I, was, I stopped and I was staring into a tree because there was a woodpecker in it. Um, and something that happens when you stop and stare at things is like other people stop and also stare at them. Uh, and so this guy who's walking his dog was kind of looking also. And then I think he thought I was trying to look into the house because he was explaining to me that it's been abandoned for a long time. He gave me this whole story. And I was like, no, 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 I'm looking at the um, woodpecker. And, uh, and then uh, he wanted to know what kind it was. So we got into this whole conversation. Um, and, you know, like it's nice that he maybe now cares about woodpeckers. But more importantly, like I met my neighbor. Um, and, uh, and I think that I... Again, there's something very qualitatively different to me about that interaction than um, than a lot of other interactions I have, um, and I'm, that's something I'm very interested in. Is like kind of um, not just yeah, not just becoming aware of the qualities, especially like the ecological and historical qualities of a place, but um, using that as a ground to a ground on which to become more connected to other people who also inhabit that space. Um, as just like I mean, you know. It, it's ground, it literally is a grounding feeling. It's something that you can come back to when you've spent, you know, like all day in this kind of placeless, timeless ether that gives you a bunch of bad feelings that you, that you feel stuck in. Like there's always this sort of ground um, that has sp specific qualities that sort of, it's here and it's not there and it's, it's now and it's not then. Um, and I think that that is, for me, like what has been like the most effective way of um, dealing with the attention economy. It's not been a screen time on my phone. It's not been another app that tells me what to do. It's something completely outside of that that renders that whole value system and sort of reality um, less real. We're about to go to audience questions, but I do want to ask you, I don't want to lose track of this idea of what would you say to those who are the purveyors of the attention economy? What responsibility and role and obligation do you think they have as they are designing the next generation of technologies? Um, user experience is an example of a, an industry that kind of created itself and grew up and got out ahead of itself before it even had real ethical guidelines, and I think we're likely to see that in many other arenas, uh, including facial rec recognition, likely in machine learning. We're already seeing some of the dangers and the pitfalls. But as technology, again, outpaces regulators, outpaces us, what do you want the, the purveyors, the creators, the marketers, the UX designers to be thinking about? I mean, I think that they're already probably thinking about a lot of this stuff, and, and I don't know, it's probably not a good feeling to design things that are addictive. I mean, there are also people who are probably, like uh, the guy that invented the, the pull to refresh has like gone on the record as saying he wished he hadn't invented that. Um, so um, I don't, I, I think I, um, I, I think there there are probably people who are I mean there's the time well spent people right like who are trying to advocate for less addictive technology I just I guess I, I would imagine that it's hard to do that within the matrix of like um, a company that has a bottom line yeah. and uh, certainly some are probably more ruthless about that than others but I I see that as kind of uh, that that's the sort of limit that I see if that makes sense. Like, I, um, I think that there are probably people being asked to design things for reasons that have to do with that. Um, and, uh, and I'm sure that there's some leeway within, within that, but at the end of the day, it's like, that's the structure that you answer to. Perhaps someone can be an insurgent in their own company and say, you know, we've got to work against this. I also think, to the extent that we are insurgents, the companies may develop counterinsurgency measures to get us back at, 
at paying attention again. Um, a last kind of question that's, that's a big picture question is I also wonder as we sit here, I asked you, I, I think I pressed a little bit about how realistic this is for people given the demands in their daily lives. The flip side of that is, is this radical enough? I mean, there are people who have lost all confidence in the major social media companies in the wake of the 2016 election and the Russian interference. We know that data has been leaked from third party vendors like Cambridge Analytica. Uh, we know that these companies have gotten so big that they have the in ability and the potential to influence outcomes of elections. And so is it enough? I just, you know, and I kept thinking of this analogy. Are we in a moment in time when it would sort of be like at some point somebody was saying, you know, smoking's okay, but you should probably cut back to one pack of, of a day instead of two packs a day. And are we sort of saying that about technology and about the attention economy? And do we need maybe a more radical strategy to say, these companies have gotten too big, they've gotten too powerful, this um, time we live in calls for something more drastic than learning to live in between and reclaiming some of our own uh, agency around attention. I'm just interested to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, I guess I don't see it as an either or. I feel like what I'm describing is like a step on the way. So I absolutely agree. But I also, at, at the very beginning of the book, describe what I'm doing is uh, not, it's, it's sort of not an activist book. It's, a, it's like, it's meant to function as like a way station for someone who's on the way. So I, it was written in response to seeing um, you know, a lot of folks who are uh, wanting to do something, could potentially do something, who are feeling paralyzed, who were themselves individually caught up with this stuff um, in a way that was just unsustainable um, and, and paralyzing. Um, and so like, that, that's, that is sort of what my argument is aimed at in the service of eventually like, larger, you know, larger changes, but that's sort of like, I don't, that's not something I can speak to. Like I'm speaking to, as an artist to, um, you know, ways of unlinking your attention from certain patterns and learning to proliferate it and withdraw it and have a sense of agency so that you can do the things that you need to do, um, whatever that might be. A couple of take homes from reading your book and from talking to you and then I'm interested to hear what you would want the audience to take home tonight. And we are about to go to questions, but I wrote down that the goal here is to rebuild empathy, responsibility, and political innovation, to trade productivity for dismantling, um, and that that is a path to manifest dismantling, including of things like racism and sexism. Um, what, what's your takeaway message? What would you like people to think about as they leave here tonight? And you know, I will, I will say, I was ex explaining to Jenny upstairs before we came down that I've already started to change my own just personal practices because of reading your book, and it's been very empowering, and I have these sort of Jenny O'Dell moments now where the other day the, I tried to pay for my parking, and it took forever to process the credit card payment, and so the little screen is spinning and spinning, and I'm staring at it mindlessly, and then I thought of you. And I stopped staring at the spinning, spinning screen, and I started looking at the tree that was planted next to the electronic parking. And I, I really tried to think, like, how would you look at this, you know? And it was empowering. And I realized how, you know, I was sucked into that little screen, not thinking about my place and time. And the moment you gave me, your book gave me, and how meaningful that was. And, and subsequently, I've done things with my kids as a result. I mean, even just last night, trick-or-treating looking up at the stars, taking that in. We weren't looking at screens, but you know, you get so focused on your destination, in this case, homes with candy. <laughs> but, you know, I, so one of my takeaways is I'd like us all to just start having Jenny O'Dell moments or do nothing moments, because I do think that these little changes you're talking about are really quite profound. But what's, what's your take home? What do you want us to think about? Just don't trademark the Jenny moment, please. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, yeah, I, I guess, um, so Manifest Dismantling, since you mentioned it, that is the title of my conclusion. It's supposed to be the opposite of Manifest Destiny. Um, and so I try to imagine the opposite of the, the, the white-robed woman in the Manifest Des uh, Destiny painting that we've all seen as someone who cleans up her mess. Um, and so uh, I give all these examples of what I consider productive, which often, uh, because of the way we think about what productivity is, often falls under words like 
restoration or remediation, um, words that sound like we're going backwards in time. Um, and I'm really interested in trying to reframe our notion of purpose and productivity um, as something that actually still does require tons of work. It requires maintenance types of work, care and maintenance that haven't been recognized as much in our society, have often been like uh, feminized or you know hidden inside the household, just, just sort of life-sustaining, um, restorative work that so clearly needs to be done. Um, I think that you know when you think about the word productivity, it's often uh, helpful to ask productive of what. <laughs> Uh, for whom and why, um, because I think our kind of operating notion of productivity, or certainly the one that we all kind of feel subject to, is really, really narrow. And I mean, that's the joke at the heart of the useless tree story, is how narrow the, the, the carpenter will only ever see lumber when he looks at trees, and then the joke is that a tree is so much more than that. So I guess that would be my takeaway, is when you, uh, when you think about what usefulness is or productivity is, to think about actually like what um, direction is that aimed in, and uh, and could you use these new, could you use pattern, new patterns of attention, new things that you pay attention to, to think about doing something other than what you're being asked to do all the time, especially if that other thing is restoring ecologies and communities. Thank you, Jenny. We would invite your questions now. Thank you both so much. Um, so I just want to remind the audience we have a microphone here and a microphone just on the other side. Uh, please use the mic for your questions so we can capture it on our recording. And then we've got about 15 minutes for questions, so just keep it brief. Hi. Uh, oh, I have a question. Uh, I'm a professor in uh, music education, and so I'm asking something that's very practical, I guess. Uh, how do you talk about what you've learned in this book with your students, and how do you think we could do that as educators for you know our children? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I mean, my situation is a little bit unique because I, it's an art class, and it's often their only art class, so actually a lot of their feelings about these things end up coming out in my class. So it, it's, I'm not even asking. It's just kind of like showing up in the work, and then we talk about it. Um, but I think um, one of the things that I, and I sort of touched on it in the op-ed that I wrote, um, I think I've been thinking a lot about um, like trust and um, and having the trust that if I create an empty space in class, um, or at just even just a space that's not me telling them things or showing them things or demonstrating things, like if I if I have the trust and I show them that I trust them to to bring actually themselves to that space, and it's always so much more interesting than anything you know like I'm going to be telling them, um, even if we're all sort of unaccustomed to that at first, like over time it becomes more comfortable, especially as you know the students get to know each other and um, just kind of creating a comfortable space for unstructured activity um, or just less structured than usual. I think just th I think that goes a long way to giving them a sense of agency. And I think also encouraging curiosity is really important. So um, you know, being willing to go off on tangents with them, um, if there's like something that they're really kind of fixated on, um, I think that can be helpful too. Would you be in favor of, it, it sometimes feels like uh, we know we shouldn't spend so much time uh, engaging with social media and things, but it's hard to resist and to fight habituation. Would you be in favor of parents and schools and even government regulators um, putting in harder regulation to sort of force us to um, engage less and, and, and dismantle more? I just think there would be so much resistance to that that I, I can't even imagine it happening. Uh, like I can't even like think through, you know, um, I mean, that because, you know, the, the, there were a lot of people who would feel that that's like an encroachment on their, on their agency in a weird way. Um, so I also, f I, I guess I'm not sure, because I, I, like I was saying earlier, I think that a lot of these things are symptoms of larger things, 
And I, and I suspect that we, we would need to address those things rather than trying to sort of like pro be prohibitive about the outgrowth of those things. Um, I just feel like also that would make some people want to do it more. <laughs> My question was kind of wondering about whether you think eventually um, social media and other things like that could be considered sort of an addictive substance similar to alcohol, tobacco, or marijuana. And if so, you think there should be regulations like um, making them more monochrome, making there be less motivation for you constantly checking it. So it's kind of a modification of his question, but sorry. No, um, I mean, that's like I mentioned time well spent before, but they're a group of ex-technology workers who are working on exactly that um, and, and having those things be regulated. So um, less persuasive design, so like less of the kind of like lab rat stuff that you see in, in social media. So um, yeah, and I mean, I'm totally in favor of that. And, but it's, there are, you know, that's being worked on. So I feel like um, after reading your book, the thing that I was able to do was do a lot of work within myself about how to um, participate in the wrong way. And like within the individual, I think it was um, possible. But now I'm working in a context where uh, I'm competing, like, our, like I work at a nonprofit, and we're competing with um, for-profit companies with money, with like the, the strategies to grab people's attention. Um, and I'm wondering if you had any ideas for like how to encourage people, like how to create collective refusal and um, for working around this framework that we kind of helplessly participate. Like we just started doing more Instagram and like it just feels like a step backwards, you know, in a way. Yeah, that's also, yeah, it's a great question. I think like there's kind of two parts. One is that, um, it's funny, the uh, someone from the California Native Plant Society uh, who interviewed me had a similar kind of feeling where they, about their Instagram account. <laughs> um, and we were talking about how, you know, on, on some level, like you have to go, especially as a nonprofit, like you have to go where the people are and that's where they are for now. Um, but I think the other side of that is um, uh, something I'm, I'm really interested in and I talk about more towards the end of the book is um, being more um, intentional about um, being more intentional about what we're saying and to whom. So kind of like a more concentrated and intentional form of what we have right now, which is a lot of shouting into the void and a lot of people trying to be heard over other people. Um, and so I mean, this is, I'm talking about on, on a more individual level, not on a, you know, in terms of an organization, but I, you know, sometimes when I'm about to, I don't know, like post something or whatever, and I will think about like who actually needs to hear this. And sometimes it's only three people. Like, why don't I just send it to those three people? Or, you know, what, like, what, why don't I just have a group chat about this thing? You know, so I think that there, um, I, I think that it, that there's, that's also something that people are kind of starved of right now is like we all are used to extremely, it's like the sort of like Netflix situation where it's like there's so many shows and they're all, a lot of them are bad. Um, and, and, but it's like cool that we have that many options and there's like always something to watch. But then like when someone actually makes something, you know, like when you see like a Hollywood film that somehow was re remained meaningful even though it had to go through that whole process, right? Like people love it. Because like people, you know, we we want that. Like we want meaning, and we want like high quality, like t you know, something that was meant for for us that had you know like that work went into and thought went into. So, um, and oftentimes I think that stuff doesn't show up in like metrics, right? So I think like putting, I mean that's happening right now in media, right? Um, and so uh, in journalism. So it's like if you if you are willing to sort of like make that leap to building maybe like less obvious network, or uh, doing, doing things that seem risky from the sort of traditional model, but you're really just giving the right things to the right people in maybe a more targeted and intentional way, that maybe that's one way of kind of like cutting through the noise, and yeah. Have you, have you read Amusing Ourselves to Death by Neil Postman? 
Uh, I'm familiar with it, but I have not, I'm embarrassed to say I have not read it. <laughs> you might find it interesting because he wrote about exactly what you're writing about, but he wrote it in 1981. Turns out this is a very old problem and goes all the way back to the telegraph, disrupting communities uh, by focusing on the news seven states away instead of the news nearby, which the newspapers had been doing. Um, I think a good way, I want to recommend that book to anyone, everyone here and you. Um, I think that we, people with addictive personalities, that's my second point, should consider turning off their phones and getting a flip phone. Uh, and also, as I'm a bookseller, rating books instead of getting your information from, your news information from the, even the best people like NPR, because at historical perspective, uh, even if it's like two years old, would be more useful than getting your news from media. Okay, thank you. I, I have to say, you know, this does prompt me to think about the value of localism, and you know, I'm, I'm a regional news reporter, and it's very hard to get attention in an environment where there's so much focus on what's happening nationally, and this reminder that we see local media uh, going away, we see newspapers folding, reducing their print days, going digital, um, that there is an impact that technology has on what is happening locally. And I think that that's a very, it's an it's a important point. Go ahead. Hello. Um, so something that struck me when you were speaking uh, was sort of the uh, way that stories, if you don't post them, then no one hears about it and you're lost in this void. Uh, there's a lot of noise, and I was thinking of Kickstarter or GoFundMe and how a lot of people who need help use these platforms to get money for various uh, things that maybe are neglected by the system or their, the institutions that should be caring about them, like healthcare or um, just just uh, things like like getting sick, right? So how, and then also, how useful those platforms are for telling people's stories that are other like marginalized, like humans of New York. And so, what are your thoughts of that? Uh, and how do you reconcile this this um, ability to to tell a story, help people, and also uh, ease away and maybe not listen because that story wouldn't be told and you'd never hear of it. Yeah, then that, I think like a, a crowdfunding is a really good example of a an, an situation where you do, I mean, you would, you want to have as many people see it as possible, but this is one of those places where, you know, again, to come back to the giant knot of inter interrelated problems, like it seems like the one of the reasons more and more people are having to turn to things like that is because we have less and less benefits, you know, for fewer, fewer and fewer people. Um, and so that, you know, that phenomenon of needing to get attention for a, you know, a very real, like, often, like, health problem is very much tied to, like, just more people not having health insurance. Um, and so, uh, like, again, to, like, the sort of uh, something being a symptom of something else, like, that I think, you know, that's one of the reasons I find it important to talk about labor history in a book that's a, supposedly about social media is because like those things are very related, right? If you have more, if you have more people who are contract workers or gig workers, then you're going to have more people subject to the time is money equation than ever before. So um, I think that that like, and it, and so someone who has having to go on Kickstarter and post something like that is is just caught in the middle of that, like that we're like in that moment of that kind of cycle. Um, and I think it's just unfortunate. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I, I saw a lot of nodding heads when you were talking about how the moment in time we're in is kind of a, a symptom of a larger problem. And I'm curious if, um, have you observed people who have similar access to the technology that we have here in America are experiencing the same kind of anxieties or dealing with these problems in the same ways? Or do the circumstances change when the circumstances of kind of their, their comfort level or their country dynamics are maybe more stable or more dependable? Um, like, are we ever going to, like, is there an equilibrium we might meet if those circumstances change since the theory is like technology is not going to go away, our ability to handle it 
it's gonna have to get better. So like, can you talk about that dynamic maybe? Yeah, um, I don't, I don't know. Um, I, uh, I mean, at the risk of sounding very pessimistic, like I, when I was doing research for this book, for example, the general strike, very inspiring example for me, but then you look and you see that like not that long afterwards, legislation was passed to make that kind of unionizing impossible. Um, and so like, and then I just, if you, if you just look over time, like I see this kind of like endless crush of, um, you know, like this, you know, uh, like advertising and uh, like other forms of the attention economy that have pre-existed um, and that it's just always taking on a new form. And like, yes, maybe we're finding ways to respond to them, but it's also always evolving. And um, and I, uh, I mean, I, yeah, I don't know. I really don't know. I get asked this kind of question a lot, like, oh, what's like right over the horizon? Or like, will we reach some kind of um, working relationship with this thing, and I, I just like zero percent. I like I don't know. <laughs> yeah. We can squeeze in two last questions if they're very efficient. I like a challenge. Um, so it wasn't explicitly talked about, uh, but the role of music in taking away our attention, but also perhaps bringing. Um, attention and connection to our experiences. How do you think about music in your life and the role it plays in taking away or adding to your attention? Um, I have a, a part in the very middle of the book where I talk about Spotify Discover Weekly versus the radio. Um, and I and I use Discover Weekly as an example of, I mean, don't get me wrong, my Discover Weekly is never terrible. Um, but it's you know based on you know what I listened to before and things that I liked and so it, like as a thought experiment if I were to keep faithfully participating in the Discover Weekly algorithms, it would eventually sort of settle on like a stable algorithmic version of like Jenny music, um, and uh, and I basically compare that to being like The Walking Dead um, in the book. But uh, and then then my, there's my car which does not have an aux input so I listen to the radio. And I have five presets. Three of them are, no, four of them are local radio stations. I actually just learned that Calex, which is the Berkeley um, radio station, UC Berkeley radio station, they have some kind of like rule that you have to play three genres, different genres in your show or something like that. I don't know if that's every show, but you just never know what you're gonna get with that station. And it's not, it's very different, right? It's not like, oh, I like every song that I hear. Um, on the, it's like I, I really don't like some of them, and then some of them I like for reasons that I don't understand, um, which is very, you know, very surprising to me and forces me to kind of exchange my sense of or acknowledge parts of myself that I didn't before. So I think there's, I guess for me, like, I think a lot about the difference between background music, which I think a lot of, you know, like the, the go-to like stations now on Spotify I would give us like examples of that, like background music for productivity, um, versus like music that surprises you that you are listening to, um, including like, you know, I talk about John Cage in the book too, like the music of just like having a span of time in which you listen to everything and you listen to all of the sounds in, a, in an intentional way. To me, that's the opposite of background music. This, this goes to one of your other really important points, place yourself in an ongoing state of encounter. And um, that, that's really something to think about. Last question. Well, encounter is a good word for it too, but I am very curious about your concept of curiosity. I'd love to know a lot more things that people aren't aware of the value of being curious about. I'm sort of curious by nature, but I don't want to miss anything. So what are the things could I be curious about that would be fun? <laughs> um. <laughs> Uh, wow, I don't, um, well, hmm. I mean, there's always, yeah, there's always something. So for, for me, I mean, I don't, I don't know if you're a bird person, but, uh, bird, the reason I, I think, think she's a frog person. Yeah, I love your shirt. It's amazing. Um, so I, the reason I, I think bird watching is actually quite profound is that birds are everywhere even if it's just pigeons. <laughs> um, 
but you know, like most places, there are birds. Um, and uh, in a lot of places, they vary seasonally. Um, so something that I have uh, recently be, uh, been getting very curious about is just um, t time and seasonality as it plays out in, in different places. So, um, you know, people often say the Bay Area has no seasons. And I, growing up there, I actually kind of thought that was true. It's very mild all year. We have a lot of evergreen trees. We have oak trees that stay green all year. Um, and, but now that I've gotten more into bird watching, I'm extremely aware of seasons. Um, so, you know, when, when I see the first cedar waxwing, it's a big deal. Or when I see the first uh, northern shoveler, or, you know, like a duck, um, like, I'm like, oh, it's winter, you know. Um, and because of that, I've then, it's opened up onto other things, like when does this type of tree flower? Not just what kind of flower, but when does it flower? Or, and then even if you know that, like, well, why is this group flowering before this one? So, like, things, I think, you know, there's, there's things you can pay attention to, but there's also time. Um, and, and most of the things that you may already be curious about, just kind of looking at them in time is like a, kind of a whole new dimension. Um, I would also add, for, you know, for everyone, historical walking tours are just like <laughs> the best thing ever. And I, I, I went on a historical walking tour of the neighborhood that my studio is in, and, and that's a walk that I do all the time and I consider myself very familiar with embarrassed to say, like, I'm like, oh, yeah, I know that area. It's super historical. Um, so it's, the, it's Jack London Square. Um, and I went on this tour, and I was just totally, I mean, it was also a really, uh, like, remarkably amazing tour. But there were really obvious things that were pointed out to me, like the shape of the roofs in that area is this weird curvy roof that you see in industrial areas from a certain era. And now that they've been pointed out to me, I see them everywhere, and I can't believe I didn't see them before. Um, things like certain buildings have, uh, they're called like fat bricks. <laughs> they're like f fatter because they're trying to get away with fewer bricks um, in this one era. And so like the bricks are a different width. Um, and now I always see that. There's just, you know, there's, there's so much time. Like, you know, there's time now like paying attention to that, but there's just so many weird little details and artifacts of very specific things that happened in the past. And I feel like even when you think you know an area, there's always going to be some more layers to that. The book is How to Do Nothing, Resisting the Attention Economy. I believe that Jenny will be signing copies out in the lobby uh, in a few minutes. Uh, thank you for coming tonight, and please join me in thanking Jenny O'Dell. Thank you. Thank you.